Hi, Phil Knight here. Welcome to tutorial three in my series on soloing. Um, up to this point, uh, the previous two tutorials, I've talked about uh, the two challenges of soloing, the two functions of soloing, if you will, um, which are the one of them is finding the notes that you're going to solo with. The other one is uh, transferring those notes to the instrument you play. Um, and as you probably gathered, I'm a firm believer that the first of these challenges or functions is really uh, an organic thing. It's a bit of a black box. Maybe it's a bit hard to look into. Um, and as far as things go at the moment, I really have a very firm belief that uh, somehow we can all do it. Your voice knows what notes to solo with. Um, I'm a firm believer in that. Um, but as for the question of, well, what if it doesn't? I think it's a perfectly valid question, and I will be looking into that question a bit later. Um, generally, though, I would say that most of the time when we think that we really can't do something, often it's because there's some sort of barrier in the way. So sometimes it's not a question of creating uh, the ability to do something from nothing. I really believe that there's a, we have a lot of things that we can already do, um, if only we remove the barriers in the way of them. So this third tutorial um, will look at the second function, um, the transferring of ideas onto your instrument, really with um, the emphasis on removing as many barriers as possible. So this is all about getting your technical knowledge up to scratch to be able to use the ideas that you come with. But I will return to the question of what happens if the ideas just don't seem to be there. What can we do? So, concentrating on the purely instrumental side of things, the technical side of things, um, for this tutorial, um, what this is about is that there's two kinds of knowledge to be aware of um, on the instrument. And I would say that one of these kind of forms of knowledge is, uh, is absolute knowledge, and the other I would call relative knowledge. And these ideas are a little bit related to the idea of perfect pitch and relative pitch. Um, the absolute knowledge on the instrument would be the idea that something like on the keyboard that, that C looks and sounds like that. Um, on this particular instrument, the same note looks and sounds like that. Um, that's your absolute knowledge. That's where that absolute pitch is. Um, but of course, for soloing, um, as for any kind of uh, sort of creative music activity, um, it's really a, a relative knowledge that is relevant. That's what you really need. Um, and your relative knowledge takes a different form, because your relative knowledge would uh, would uh, be a way of acknowledging that um, no matter what your starting point is. Uh, all of your keys are the same. Um, all of your keys in the octave are pretty much really the same. They are the same key. Um, it's just the, the the what we call the key or the signature key is simply a locator. So um, knowing that that's B flat, that's one thing. But it's much more interesting as a soloist to know that uh, a major third looks like that, or that a fifth looks like that or that a major seventh is this, or that an octave looks like that, or like that. Um, the same is also true, uh, This there I started on B-flat. Um, if I start the thing, the same thing on uh, on D, then uh, here is a major third, here is a fifth, here is a sixth, major seventh, octave. Now, that's your relative knowledge, and that's the kind of knowledge you need to be building um, as a soloist. Now, I wouldn't contend that absolute knowledge on the instrument is without its, uh, without its value. Um, con on the contrary, it's good for me to know that B-flat looks like that, and E-flat looks like that, or on the keyboard that they look like that, because these are locators um, which would be very important, especially if I'm sp playing in a situation where I'm with a band playing with other musicians and uh, we're in a certain key. It'd be stupid of me to start soloing in a different key. So these are my locators, but I would contend that that absolute knowledge um, 
is really getting in the way uh, when what I really need is uh, a relative knowledge of intervals um, and I really actually need a sort of quite a, a silent knowledge. Um, I just need to be able to react on the instrument to the uh, to the ideas that are coming um, by somehow connecting directly from the ideas coming out of my voice to the intervals that I'm creating and how they manifest themselves on the instrument that I'm working with. So uh, we really want to be able to put that that absolute knowledge aside. Now, that question is a little, it's rather easier on this instrument than it is on this one. And the reason why is because this instrument, which I've built myself, has been built to be what we call isomorphic. The idea is that all relations this way and all relations this way are the same. So no matter what I play um, in any key, it's always going to be the same. So if I play, say, a major triad um, in an arpeggio from the, the root note, the major third up to the fifth, um, that's what it looks like in B flat. If I do exactly the same thing here in D flat, it's exactly the same shape. I can do it here. Oh, that was B flat again. No, I'm doing it in C, doing it in E, I'll do it in F sharp, there we go. It doesn't matter where I do it, it's the same. So on here I can quickly forget um, anything about the absolute nature of tones uh, <laughs> of where I am really in, in the chromatic octave because uh, no matter what I do, I can pretty much do it everywhere, so I can do it just the same. Um, that was designed uh, specifically to be that way. Um, now instruments that aren't the same over all over we call uh, heteromorphic that's uh, the different as in the different form um, here we have the keyboard for example this is a heteromorphic instrument and the reason is because uh, we have the illusion that the different keys are actually different because they look very different if you compare the major triad that I've got there on C with the major triad I've got on D flat these are musically exactly the same value, relatively, um, and yet they look and feel very different. If you were to measure the distances in them, you'd find that they were, actually, they were actually quite different. So playing in different keys on this keyboard, uh, is it, each key has its own experience based on tactile uh, attributes, um, whereas an isomorphic instrument it's the same, uh, any any key is the same experience, uh, but very different on here. So this creates um, a bit of a trap uh, into feeling as though, um, as though each key is, a, is a, a unique thing, a unique experience that keeps us stuck in our absolute knowledge uh, to some extent. Now there are lots of examples of isomorphism like this and heteromorphism in musical instruments just to give you a few examples. Um, the keyboard is a heteromorphic structure uh, as is traditional guitar tuning um, which goes up in fourths until it breaks into a major third at one point and there can be many reasons for doing that. It gives you certain advantages, there are certain things that are uh, beneficial in having a heteromorphic um, structure and sometimes it's simply necessary. A lot of wind instruments are heteromorphic so they also ha seem to um, they seem to, they, they, they would also have a different experience uh, of playing different keys. Um, the downside of this of course is that um, instruments tend to have a favorite key. Um, a lot of piano players talk about they like to play on the white notes uh, or you might prefer just to play on the black notes but the key just seems to have a um, uh, a physical structure that uh, that makes it beneficial um, until you've somehow technically got around that. Uh, wind instruments often uh, and stringed instruments often have um, keys that they seem to favor um, especially for certain things. Um, so that's sort of keeping you trapped really in this uh, in this absolute knowledge um, and you have to uh, train your way out of it if you want to get around that now next question is what can we do really to train our way out of it and I would say that uh, you could do a lot of exercises to to help you um, acquaint yourself with certain intervals so you could for example say well these are fifths so you could learn fifths all over the whole keyboard and you could just keep doing this 
it's horribly unmusical and then you could do it for fourths feel how old they are and then you could feel how all your major thirds are and if you were interested in uh, playing in tritones you could uh, check all of those out and uh, I'd say that you know if you as long as you're having fun uh, by all means you know knock yourself out um, but as a uh, as a, a, a sort of a holistic kind of a, a guy um, I would generally say that uh, if you're not having a, a great amount of fun doing that then um, more musical uh, exercises are definitely for you and the best way really to uh, to learn about the interval structure on your instrument on your heteromorphic instrument is to uh, is to play some melodies now just take a little a little melody it doesn't have to be a great sort of uh, complicated jazz thing um, let's just take a melody like for example oh susanna which is what it looks like in C, um, and just sort of try moving it around. Uh, now, if you're not used to doing that kind of thing, you're going to make a few mistakes. Um, and if you're really into avoiding making mistakes, you could do a lot of study and figure out that, oh, that was that scale and that was that scale, and you could do, find all that, all, what all your scales are. But... Um, why not just work with the melody? Use your musical ear. Make your mistakes. Correct your mistakes. Um, that, uh, to my mind, is one of the best ways um, to simply learn the anatomy of your instrument inside and out. Take a melody, play it all over the place. Right, well, I'm going to leave you with a sort of a parting thought here, which is really a kind of... Uh, moral and it is that um, in my experience the pitfall um, in working with your relative knowledge the knowledge that you need to solo is that the absolute knowledge just won't stop knocking on the door and getting in the way it's our analytical mind um, perhaps you might call it our ego that needs to know things like uh, well if I started an E flat then what's what's that note and where are we and uh, you know, these analytical thoughts, which are sort of uh, technical knowledge, um, sort of at arm's length. Uh, once you've located where you are, live with it. Feel your way. Don't be afraid to be blind. Um, use your musical ear to guide you. And I think the idea uh, here, the moral here, is really to use your analytical knowledge to, uh, to tell you where you are uh, in terms of absolute pitch. Um, but then to be able to just let go.